we were told by David Griffin four or five years ago, sustainable success. We finished 13th, 11th, 9th, and 9th, which then turned into 10th because we lost to the 10th seed. So that doesn't sound like sustainable success to me. What's up, Pels fans? We're back here. I'm here with Calvin. Man, let me tell you something. He, If you need a defensive end, go to the portal. He's available. He's trying to get himself on the team. Calvin's one of those guys that, man, you just you just really, really root for. We're here to talk about the Pels season and kind of how it went, how disappointing it was at some points, but then again, how there's some highlights in there. And really what we're going to talk about today is the optics surrounding the Pelicans season. And, and that really boils down to a lot of different things. But before I go any further, Calvin, I want you to introduce yourself, man. Tell us what's up. Uh, what's up, y'all? Uh, I'm Calvin. Uh, as y'all can see, obviously, Pelicans fan. Uh, man, I've been supporting uh, my Pelicans for a long time since, hey, since that jersey you got on, since the <laughs> Hornets days. <laughs> uh, yeah, I am in the portal. I am a defensive end. I have been playing at Louisiana Tech University for the past five seasons. Looking for a new home. Uh, if y'all know anybody, <laughs> hit them up. Hey, I'm taking all offers, but yeah, that's that's me. I like it. Well, hey, like I said, we're going to talk today a lot about the optics surrounding the Pelicans. And what do I mean by that? So everybody kind of has this hometown bias for the Pelicans if you're a true Pelicans fan, right? I mean, Calvin said earlier, right? He grew up as a Pelicans fan. But what does everybody else think about the Pelicans as well as how do we compare that with what we think about the Pelicans? Uh, I think we were actually somewhere in that happy medium. Uh, in the beginning of the season, it was mostly a lot of, you know what, we're a good team. We should be better than that, uh, last year because Zion. Zion's going to be healthy, assumingly, for you know the beginning of the season, and he was. Um, but the Pelicans did something they shouldn't have done, and that was give us hope by giving <laughs> us the one seed. That is when everything took off. There's two things that, that happened. The Lakers were bad. Mm-hmm. And we were really good. We were, I believe, you know, the first seed, and they were probably, what, 13th, something like that, 13th, yeah. 14th. So we're sitting here like, Wimby and potentially first pick. So, I mean, hey, it, it, it was it was very bad on the Pellets part for, for giving us that type of hope. But I don't think any of us had expectations of winning a championship, you know, just because it's like, all right, Let's see how this team gels with Zion. And that's really what it was supposed to be. How is the team reacting to Zion? And they reacted like, hey, we're going to show you that we are uh, uh, one of the best teams in the Western Conference, if not the rest of the league. I mean, you go 23 and 12, you're first in the Western Conference in January. I mean, that's that's pretty good. I mean, that's 30-something games in, and, and you're winning. And, you know, unfortunately, it just didn't end up the way that we wanted to. Yeah, I think that's a huge piece of it. We're going to talk about more about the health and kind of some of those things later. But one of the things that I think we all that that's kind of lost in this because of how good it seemed that we were going is that the Pelicans ended with a winning record. We were 42 and 40, right? That hasn't happened since the 2017-2018 season. And so we've been through a bunch of years where it's been it's been rough. He even here recently even last year, I mean, heck, last year we got to the playoffs and had a losing record. And one of the things that we kind of gets lost a little bit, and not saying that I'm happy with how the season went, but we did have a winning record. We had a winning record, and CJ, Zion, and BI all played like 12 games together, right? So anytime you look at that stat, you kind of have to be happy that we did end with a winning record. But overall, you can also say like, dude, we've got to figure something out. And I think that especially in the postgame uh, or postseason pressers with a lot of the team uh, in front office and everything, I think that you saw a lot of kind of shots maybe going back and forth. You know, we saw Larry, you know, he, he him say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to play uh, as much as I can. You saw CJ especially. He said, dude, I tore my labor in my shoulder. I've needed surgery on my thumb for like three months, and I still played, and I was out here. I don't know if that was directly at Zion or if I was directly at somebody else, but, I mean, how do you see – how do you look at a comment like that and think that everything is okay in the locker room? 
Well, I'm going to put it in the context of being an athlete, right? Sure. You know, so, you know, these last, you know, five seasons or whatever. As a as a athlete, you look at it and you have to think if you're Zion, how can you look at your teammates, right? Mm-hmm. We get so many conflicting reports, you know, it's getting hard to really, you know, know who's lying and who's not. But you have Zion saying, oh, I'm physically ready to go. And then you have David Griffin saying, oh, nope, he misspoke. That's not true. I mean, I'm more inclined to believe the athlete because nobody knows the their body better than the athlete. So if Zion says he's physically ready to go, but mentally he's not, I mean, look, I'm a big believer in mental health. I think it's really important. I had a calf strain injury during the season. It's my first major injury. I was supposed to miss like four to six weeks. I came back in two because I decided to rehab three times harder than what I was supposed to. Mm-hmm. And I came back, you know, like what B.I. said and, you know, like Larry said, came back a little earlier than they should have. So – you know, I wouldn't miss any reps. I wouldn't miss any games. And I just feel as if for Zion, it just feels a little bit disingenuous, really, mm. because, you know, the team was struggling with him. You're on a 10-game losing streak. All right, you see that as a as the star athlete. You look at that and you're like, okay, yes, the team really needs me. So then now when it's crunch time, the last two weeks of the season where every game is amplified, really those last two weeks, you can argue that that's really playoff basketball. Yeah, because every game mattered. It really felt as if if you lose a game, you're going home. Yeah, and you've seen it. You lose the Rockets game, and now you're home. If yeah. you don't lose that Rockets game, it could be you know playing the Nuggets, you know, or yeah. anything, you know. Uh, but it just feels disingenuous because you 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 have a guy that good, and then he even he knows he's that good. He sees his team struggling, and and they're just in the water without a life preserver. And yeah. then he says, you know what? I could come back, but uh, mentally I ain't ready. I think well, the thing, I, though, is that yeah, Zion I, has to understand is that he's – an injured Zion is still the best player on the team. Yeah, you know? I think that I think that's really interesting because kind of what you said about you working hard to get back after an injury, that's how he re-injured his hamstring, or that's what we – that's like the report that we have that's out, right, is that he was trying really hard to get back and then something happened, and I don't know if it was a restrain, if whatever it was – but he he was trying to push himself to get back. So you want to say like, hey, there is some. Like he recognizes how much the team needed him, and he tried to go hard like you did from your calf strain. But ultimately, it just like really didn't work out for him, and he ended up injured. And that could have even even something like that could mess with your mental down the road when you're trying to take it to that next step of rehab, recovery, and, and some of those things. And really, what happened is. Around Zion, around B.I., around C.J., Jonas, Herb, I mean, really everybody, what happened on, um, uh, you know, both of us are on Pell's Twitter. What really happened on Pell's Twitter is everyone started, like, going after each other. You had, like, crazy takes going here, crazy takes going there. I mean, so much so that Will Guillory from The Athletic said that Pell's Twitter is in a bad place. Like, it is not going well over here right now. So, what do you think that is as when we, like, as fans, we see uh, our favorite team going and we see somebody have a bad take? Like, how how are we supposed to react to something like that when we do have so much passion and frustration? Like, what are we supposed to do with something like that? Well, see, you know, Twitter is a beautiful place because it's a place where you get that frustration off. You go and be emotional. If you look at my tweets, I will have very emotional tweets where I am <laughs> – sitting there calling the team a bunch of weenies. Like, I know these guys aren't a bunch of weenies. You know, I know that Zion probably wants to come out here and, and play. I don't doubt that. I really don't. I understand, you know, a lot of people are calling CJ a terrorist. <laughs> I mean, do I believe he's a terrorist? No, of course not. But, you know, he didn't play that well down the stretch when we really needed him to. I get that. So it's just an emotional thing. It's just emotion. That's yeah. all it is, you know. And you know, Pell's Twitter is a bad place. It is. It, it really is. You you will you go from top of the world, you know, a team that's never really seen winning like that, to you're back at the bottom, and that sucks because a lot of people were talking a lot of smack to the Lakers, for example, and that's the Lakers are now kind of like intertwined with us. They just have to be, you know, about what happened, you know, five years ago, and. Now now you see a, a little bit of a rivalry going on, just not even really between the teams, but between the fans themselves. Mm. And it's a bad look, especially on Pels fans, man. 
We start out saying, oh, man, the Lakers are going to get wimpy. The Lakers are bad. Ha, ha, ha. We're great. We're good. Yeah, we're better than y'all. And then they turn out to finish higher than us. I mean, that doesn't make sense. So, yeah. I, Hell's I, Twitter is definitely in a bad spot, man. Yeah, I genuinely have not recovered from Matt Ryan making that three to beat us. I still have not. Like, it, I have yeah. not forgotten about that dude who was bagging groceries, like, two days before. But I have not like that was that was one of the most frustrating games that I've watched in a long time, especially. Yeah, it that. Yeah, there is the Laker games, the Phoenix games. Those games mean a lot more. I mean, even even the you know, Memphis, the Memphis games mean a lot more. And I think you're right. You know, Pell's Twitter does become a very, very toxic place very quickly. And what happens is, I mean, this is just social media in general, not to be like this old dude screaming from the top of the mountain but it is the thing is like you know know, this is the first time that we've really really talked like in person we still haven't met in person and so if i'm just you know adding you on twitter or whatever it's kind of like i just forget that you're a person like you have a whole nine to five or you have like a whole college like job or whatever to go to and and we just like completely forget that because we are behind the screen or whatever and so we so quickly do we lose what connects us and our opinions and what we feel and whatever kind of goes in front of truly what we like know to be right or good as a, you know, a, a person in general. And I, I, it's kind of leads into the next point of from the outside looking in. So whether that's on um, you know Twitter, whether that's on Instagram, whether that's on ESPN, whatever it is from the outside looking in, when people look at the Pelicans, when people look at the fan base, when people look at, you know, what does this team look like? What, what do you think that other teams think about the Pelicans? I think the players around the league, they have great respect for the Pelicans. you just seen what Paul George said on his podcast. Herb Jones should be the defense player of the year. Yeah. Hey, yeah. no one would know better than the guy who got held to under 20 points by Herb Jones. He'll, yeah. you know, let him tell it to you. Uh, you have – some of these reports, you know, Kendrick Perkins, you know, I mean, we all think Kendrick Perkins is a clown. I personally think he's a clown. You know, those type of guys, you know, the big media is never really going to, you know, like us. You know, mm-hmm. that's just how it is. That's just the unfortunate business, you know. Um, we're the little guys. And they look at this team as an absolute failure. Like, oh, you have Zion. Like, what's what's the problem? They don't really know the inner workings of the team. They don't really know what David Griffin is telling us. But the players, I think the players really do know what's up. And you can definitely tell by the way they play us. I feel like we have gotten a lot of teams' best hits. Like, they've thrown their best punches against us, even mm-hmm. when we were down uh, Zion and B.I., because they understood. Like, you have guys like Jose, those scrappy guys who are going to keep fighting. They have to keep fighting, too. And, I mean, look at the Warriors game, the, uh, the last Warriors game. We got punched in the mouth in the second half. Yeah, they came out and they they gave it to us. If you yeah. look at the Timberwolves game, they did not go away. If you look at the Thunder game, that was a very stressful game for someone who was there. You know, you know, I yeah. was there. I'm and 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 hearts racing the whole time. My knees are hurting just just watching it because like they will not go away. And then look what happens. Look how many times a team has a good game against us and then does terrible the next game. Uh, OKC right, Lou Dort. Uh, Josh Giddy and Shea all dropped 30 plus on us. And then the next game, Lou Dort has like seven. Josh Giddy has like six. Shea has like 20. Mm. They all use their life force against us. That's just yeah. how it is. So the players respect us. I know they do. Uh, the media does not respect us. Yeah. And if you're a fan of another team like the Lakers, I'm not even going to get into that because that's just the way NBA Twitter is. If a team is bad, If the record says they're bad, they don't care about the inner workings and, oh, this happened, this happened. They don't care about the extracurriculars of why the record is that way. It's just they're bad. They're terrible. Right. So any other franchise is probably going to say we're terrible. Yeah. I think it's it's interesting because one of the things that um, when when the LeBron and MJ and Kobe debates, whenever they get brought up, I'll forget which media person said it, but they said that the reason they had Kobe over LeBron – was the fact that people respect LeBron, but people fear Kobe, right? People feared going against him. 
And I think that that's a pretty, pretty accurate parallel to where the Pelicans are, is that people respect the Pelicans, like Zion is good, B.I. is good, C.J.'s the, you know, was voted the president, right? I mean, like, people respect everybody. People respect Jose and Herb and, you know, uh, Trey Murphy. Like, people respect those guys, but they don't fear them. And that's that's where that edge kind of comes, is that that's where the Pelicans are really, really lacking, is that they're – is a lot of inconsistency across the board is that you don't know who's going to be playing night night to night. You don't know who's going to show up night to night, which has uh, some positive, positive aspects to it, but also has some really negative aspects to it because you don't know who to rely on consistently. You know, there's a, there's that thing that goes around where it says, you know, uh, Brandon Ingram uh, is, gets injured. Um, he plays bad plays like an all-star, plays all B, all NBA, and then gets injured again. Like it's a revolving circle of <laughs> that's how his uh, his career has been. And we see something like that, and it's like you want to reply, but like it's it's right. One of the things yeah, that can. we yeah, one of the things that we have to understand is we are are we are and will be our own worst enemy continuously when it gets uh, down to it. I mean, you saw everybody being questioned this year, right? First, it was JV was bad, and then JV was good. Then Willie's bad. Then Willie's good. Then Willie's bad. Then, you know, B.I.'s it, – it never ceases to amaze me how much we go left and right on certain uh, players here and there. Like, it, it, it is incredible, you know, to see. So when we think about our perception around the league, I think it's really tough to honestly get a good gauge because, honestly – the teams that we play on a Monday night are not the teams that we play on a Wednesday night, and we are not the same team both games. So there's teams that show up that we absolutely smash and destroy on the court, and then on Thursday it comes around, it's like we lose to Houston, right? So you just – you don't know, and I think that's what our um, – from a front office, from a coaching, from a player, um, even from a fan and experience standpoint, that is where the Pelicans are right now is – we're just inconsistent across the board. And so when we think about, you know, these, all of these things, all these questions, all, everything that we've been talking about, you know, what do you think would be your grade for the season in, in general, overall, what do you think your grade overall for the Pelican season is? So let me preface it by saying this, right? Willie Green in his interview, he said, ah, oh, you know, what? this is a successful season. We went 500. I'm not one of those guys. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm not necessarily saying I'm a, if you don't win the chip, you get an F. Like, no. But this is a D to C season. It is. I don't care that we went 500. I would rather us not go 500. Because, like I said earlier, you made the mistake of showing me what you can be. And you mm. wasn't that. You couldn't sustain that. That whole first C stuff, that wasn't an accident. That wasn't a fluke. That was based off of consistent play, night in, night out. And, of course, we were healthy. But... Everything just went downhill. You went from being one of the deepest teams in the league to, man, I, I, I don't know if these guys can play. And, you know, that's what happens whenever, you know, your role players hit their red line. Their role players are role players. They ain't supposed to be playing 30 minutes a game. That's just not how it is. And then you've seen it. Everybody's body starts degrading a little bit. Everybody starts getting hurt. Um, and, you know, we just start slowing down. But, man, this is this has not been – a successful season because if you look at the timeline thing, this is why I'm grading it off of the timeline. Mm. We, we were told by David Griffin four or five years ago, sustainable success. We finished 13th, 11th, 9th, and 9th, which then turned into 10th because we lost to the 10th seed. So that doesn't sound like sustainable success to me. This is a failure. To me, we should be where the Kings are, albeit the Kings have been healthy. But the truth of the matter is, that team doesn't have more talent than we do. It doesn't. Okay, see, maybe you can argue that, whatever, because they're young, whatever. The Grizzlies, do I think they have more talent than us? No. Do the Nuggets have more talent than us? No. I think we are probably one of the most talented. Yeah, I know it's hot take, but, you know, I think we're one of the most talented teams in the league. Um, and the fact that just the way everything went, it's a failure. It's not a failure on the players necessarily. It's a failure for the entire organization. 
just the way things are ran. The communication between the fans with injuries, the way the coaching staff flailed and floundered all year. I was not happy with Willie Green this year. I don't care what anybody says. He did not. After Zion went down, he was not that great of a coach. He wasn't. And just the culmination of how everything went, you cannot look me in my eyes or in anybody's eyes and say this is a success of a season. You can't look in these players' eyes and say this is a success of a season. It's just not. So in, in my mind, you know, I'm, I'm hearing you say a lot of different things um, that kind of go together. I want you to rank these next five or six categories in order from who do you think has the most blame? Okay, so who do you think okay. has the most blame for this season? Okay, let's go coaching number one. Let's go front office. Let's go players. Then we'll do after players, we'll go, uh, I'll, I'll do training staff in, in general. And then let's do, let's do, throw a fifth one in there. And, and I want to see after this what you think about how our um, experience as a fan, kind of how that goes. So, Coaching, let's see, players, then we'll do, you know, off front office GM type stuff. We'll do health, our training programs, our trainers, and then we'll also go with our kind of fan experience. Where do you think those five, where would you rank them in order of like, you are the problem? Where would you rank them? <laughs> okay, so obviously the fans are not the problem. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's put them last. We are not the problem, right? We are just getting what we're giving, you know? That's, that's, that's what it is. Uh, I will say... I would say players are probably next. I would like to throw some blame on the players because sometimes they do be acting like some weenies every now and then, but I understand. Mm. Um, health is number one. Mm. And I am, you know, I, whether that's on the training staff or the players themselves, that's why all this could be kind of murky a little bit because yeah. could you say technically the player, like let's talk about Zion, a player, is he motivated enough to rehab multiple times a day, you know, all that. But, you know, players are, you know, fourth. I think the front office could be three. I would probably rank them higher, but whenever I tell you about why I rank coaching higher, uh, I was very, very, very disappointed in the front office and their plan at the trade deadline. Yeah. Seeing fair. the Lakers completely change their team and go from a terrible team to a good team, all with the low, low price of Russell Westbrook's terrible contract, a first-round pick, and a little measly second. That's all it took to get Rui Hachimura, Jared Vanderbilt, Malik Beasley, D'Angelo Russell. I know I'm forgetting somebody else, but that's all it took. And you had guys out there like OJ Nobi, Boyan Bogdanovich, Gary Trent, maybe Fred Van Vliet, uh, Mikael Bridges. Obviously, he was on the list. I mean, you know, I don't think we could have got him, but at least try. You know, we have a plethora of picks. I just felt as if we just didn't do enough. Yes, we got rid of Devontae Graham and his contract. Do I think Josh Richardson is a better option? Yes, because he can play defense. And he can shoot just as well, about the same percentages, if not better. Mm -hmm. I, I just felt like sitting on your hands whenever you've seen the Lakers. Once the Lakers started making moves, I would have said, you know what, this pick swap probably won't be the best idea. Because right now this team is deep. It is, whether or not you agree, it is deep. I don't yeah. think drafting a guy right now is on par with what we're doing because we don't have time to develop them. I mean, right now, Dyson Daniels don't look like we have time to develop him either. What are we trying to do? And the front office hasn't shown me a direction definitively yet. Mm. And they did not. They were too uh, timid to take that next step of trade the picks, trade this person, trade this, so we could go and get another option. Because I do believe this team has pr uh, proven to, uh, that, that they're not going to be healthy. B.I., C.J., and Zion, they're just not going to play all games together. They're not going to play all 82. Might not even play 60 games together. They might even play 50. So you should have went and go get another option to help C.J. out. That's your fail safe because you know that these guys aren't going to be healthy. But coaching. Coaching is number two because there's been too many times. I get it. Credit to Willie because the amount of things he's had to go through, the injuries, the, the trades, the young people, the first year, the second year coaching, I get it. But there has been too many times where I have seen Willie just kind of sit there with this dumb look on his face of, uh, I, I, I don't really know what to do. Or, uh, uh, you know, he's looking to, to Jerry Collins and he's like, you know, telling him. And it's just like, Willie, man, uh, the lineups were very, very wild. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't think that Willie took advantage of mismatches at all this season. Mm -hmm. There's been times where JV has a guy 
who's a very small guy like Alfred Singu, I'm just using him as an example, guys like that who cannot play defense on guys like JV, and we wouldn't go to JV. I think our offense was way too stagnant. The the whole ISO ball and just try to get B.I. the ball with uh, high mm. uh, high key screens. I didn't like that. That He was working way too hard for those shots. I didn't like con- uh, shooting so many contested mid-ranges when we were giving up threes. I didn't like it. The medias are cool, but doing it over and over and over and over again, that's not creative. Um, there has been times where we have been on the wrong side of a run. You know, I'm talking 10 those, 11 those, 12 those, and Willie is not calling a timeout. Mm. Or we've seen many times when there should be someone playing, like, for example, uh, a Kira game, Kira Lewis game or a Jackson Hayes game. It's very obvious that those two should be playing in certain games, and they just don't. They don't mm. get minutes. And then the most recent egregious thing that I can think of from Willie is the OKC game. Mm. Kara Lewis has not played mm. <laughs> he has not played significant minutes or valuable minutes all season long. Mm. And then you decide in a game where it's win or go home, the first person off the bench is gonna be Kara Lewis. Now that would have been a great sentiment, you know, post All Star break, which I think he should have been playing because our offense was bad. Kira was shooting like forty one percent at in, from three in some month. But he decided to do it then, and it mm. showed. Kara was not ready. I mean, that's what happens when you have a guy on the bench all season, and now in the most important game, he has to step up. That's just not going to be. That's just not going to happen. It's not realistic. The, and um, the the part of that that is the most concerning, I think, is the simple fact that's not the first time he's done that. Last year, no. during the play-in game, he played Tony Snell. Out of yeah. nowhere. <laughs> yeah. He did the Tony same Snow. exact thing to Kyra this year. It makes no sense. And I, I think that a lot of it a lot of it does count come down to coaching because and you know, later um, you know, we're gonna talk more of the basketball with uh, you know, Mike Sip. But the thing that frustrated me the most is that Willie tried so hard to make his system so easy. And the difficult yeah. part is that if your system is very, very easy, you have to run it very, very well. And because of the fact that so many guys cannot do the high screens like Zion, like BI, and you try to make CJ into a second player more than just what he is, which is a second guy who, or a third guy even on, on our team, where it is a, he's a catch and shoot. He's a, mm-hmm. somebody who cannot control that, that full, um, you know, the full role that you want him to. I think it's really difficult because you, I mean, even Trey Murphy said towards the end of the season that, you know, the, the jig is up or, or whatever he said. They got, they got film, man. Yeah. They got it, film. And, and that's what it is, is that like everybody knows what's coming. You know, it's a JVBI high screen pick and roll with CJ on the opposite side who dives, Herb dives. Sometimes there's a, a alternate where there's a second screen or the, like you could, you could say you could, that play probably happened. 30% of the game on offense, if not more. Yes. And yes. at what point do you look and just say, this is the problem? Like this is, and, and it's kind of one of those things where he, he stuck himself in a corner, right? Because, and some of it's not his fault. And and I know we recognize this, but in December, right? Zion goes out, you don't have BI and you're just trying to piecemeal it until BI gets back, right? Yeah. Okay, BI gets back. Now you're trying to run that same system and you don't want to change that system because you think Zion is coming back. Because you think, oh, well, B.I. just needs a couple games. We don't want to change it just yet because this is a system that everybody knows. And you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting and you're not making changes. All-star break is here. You think everybody's getting healthy. You think Zion's about to come back. And then he re-injures himself. And now you're post-all-star break and you can't change the offense post-all-star break and completely rehaul it. Because you're now in games that matter more. And now yep. you are just stuck with the offensive system that you have with the offensive players that you have and you just kind of kind of roll with it and i know that people were upset with him down the stretch but he almost got forced into that because of the injuries that happened and i think now, you know he, I'm, I'm glad that you said that i am yeah. because like if you look at our 10 game losing streak that's the biggest indictment that i have on that's the most consistent 
uh, uh, body of work I have against my my Willie Green is not that great agenda. Uh, that 10-game losing streak, how many of those games was JV the leading scorer when he should have been? I will probably say maybe one. I think okay. it's, He went think away it from two, JV. Yeah. yeah, one or two. JV, to me, is a big part of this team. And the fact that Willie Green kind of just doesn't want to use him is just baffling to me. The guy can shoot threes. He's a post monster. Get you rebounds. Use him. Because CJ, CJ's hurt. And CJ had to keep having that heavy workload. And I think as a coach, you have to recognize that. And it's like what you said, uh, you have to change it up. And I will always say that when Zion went down and we went that long stretch of games and just losing, then we win a game and then, oh, we're back to a three-game losing streak or four-game losing streak. We were playing like we're waiting for someone to save us. And that was Zion. Mm. We were just kind of waiting in the wings like, okay, guys, look, we're going to try, but – Help is on the way. Zion's going to come back. He's going to come back. And then when we started playing well again, there was a, a massive click because you can say the team that we saw post-January was not the same team pre-January at all. Things were just not going anybody's way. And once they made that that switch in, in March, got, you know, we were winning a lot of games in March and late February. I think that's when they realized nobody's coming to save us. Mm. The guys we have playing – are the guys that's playing. Zion ain't coming back. Zion's not playing right now. It's just us. And I think that's that's what you've seen. But they just ran out of gas at the end. And, and Willie Green, to me, just didn't really do much to help that. He didn't – I don't believe he developed Dyson better this year. He didn't develop Kyra better this year. Um, I don't believe he developed Jax. Jax has some pretty decent minutes to me. You know, as much as I, you know, talk down on Jax, but I think Jax had a pretty decent – season, one of his better seasons, if I had to say, even though statistically he won't say that, but mm-hmm. I I was fine with him being in the in the play-in game because he's athletic, and yeah. JV is tired, and JV is a little slower, yeah. and uh, you know, Billy ain't gonna get you ain't, ain't, ain't gonna get you much, so you know, Willie Green to me is just, he's very questionable, very questionable sometimes. Well, the thing that is also, that couples with that is you've seen him in games Focus on getting Trey Murphy looks. Focus on getting JV looks in the post. I can't remember what game it was, but there were a couple games post All Star break where we went to JV for like the first ten, like I would say like like nine of the first fifteen or twenty possessions. It was like it's going to JV and his role is to get the ball up and score, right? Like that. And it was working, and it worked very well. And it worked, and then it was okay. Now that JV has this momentum going. They're going to key on him, and now we're going to start setting back screens or wing screens or flare screens or elevator screens for Trey, for CJ. And then off of those, we're going to get uh, dive cuts from Herb. We're going to do – and so it it ended up working so much better, and you've seen that. I think that's what everybody got frustrated about was we have seen Willie Green be a good coach and run good offensive sets with Zion, without Zion – with BI, without BI, we've seen it. And it's just not consistent. And I no. oftentimes think that he overthinks his own game plan. Like, yeah. when you break it down, basketball is a simple game. But yeah. if you try to do too much or try to do all things at once, most of the time you can get pigeonholed into one specific thing. So I, I think it's tough, um, you know, as a whole to to blame anything on one person. I really right. do. And I think Willie did an okay job. He has it, – it's kind of hard to fault the guy because our offensive, you know, health has, has been so so bad. Right? Hey, the players respond to him too, you know. Yeah. But, you know, it is tough. I mean, you know, look at that Timberwolves game. Yeah. Right? Cat has five fouls in the fourth quarter, and you don't put JV in. You don't even yeah. try to foul him out. That's nuts to me. And then, you know, Anthony Edwards is going off. You're not denying him the ball. It's – it was – mind-boggling to me what the decisions were from from Willie and you know we end up losing the game and that was a game that we just couldn't have lost and we yeah. did you know I, I think that one of the things we've talked about this is saving coaches from themselves right about yeah. trading certain players and, and everything especially with Willie the front office really as many favors as they have done him with putting a good competent offensive roster in the game defensively he doesn't have a lot there and not only that yeah. I would say he has a consistent like eight players, maybe yeah. nine players. 
And, you know, 10 through 15, people argue that they're not important. 10 through 15 are extremely important pieces, right? Especially because, when 10 through 15 have to turn into 7 to 9. Exactly. Because of injuries. Exactly. Like Willie Hernan Gomez, right? Like, I, he's a great asset, but he is nothing more than a third rotation center in the NBA. Yeah. Garrett Temple is making $5 million just because they like him, right? You know, and then yeah. drafting a guy that you want to develop. And then, you know, whatever Jackson Hayes is, whatever he is, having him <laughs> on top of, you know, layer it. Like, and then Kyra, it's like Kyra's in his third year, came back from ACL surgery over the offseason, has worked really hard, doesn't necessarily – deserve to lose his role but at the same time it's like you just drafted this guy top 10 overall and i know the front office is in his ear saying like you draft this guy you know top 10 last year we are not going to you know try to continue to develop Kyra. and it's like he put there's so many different offensive um or there's so many different decisions you have to make as a coach that the front office is supposed to make better for you but realistically yeah. i mean at this point for, from a Pelicans organization standpoint, you have to go out and you have to get players, like you said, from players who are you know 10th, 11th, 12th, who could realistically be a 7th, 8th man on another team. And you have to explain to them, like, you're not always going to play, but you absolutely will because our team cannot stop getting injured, right? I really yeah. – uh, I don't know. You're a uh, – you know, you and Logan do the, the hit piece and, and, and y'all cover – um, Saint stuff as well. I really wish they would put out a grading sheet like they did for the NFL for the NBA because I would love to see where the Pelicans <laughs> rank on uh, on that, and I would I would be fearful on some of that. But last thing I, I kind of want to touch on is what do you think? I was able to uh, go to a few games this year. You know, I, I recently had to move, and I think you're able to go more than I was just being down there. But what do you think? Um, from a fan's perspective, from going to as many games as you went to, do you think the Pelicans fan experience is a good thing? Or do you think the fan experience needs work? Or do you think it's bad? Kind of where do you think it is? I think it is, it's been the best that I've seen, like hmm. through all the years I've been going. Uh, they keyed in on, and I, I've, I've said it before, uh, you know, a couple years ago, I was like, you know, we need more like New Orleans feel in there. You know, we need more like, Better halftime shows, better in between timeout stuff, like like the culture base. And we had a lot of guys, you know, brass bands and people from here who were performing, and it felt great. And it, you know, it was like one big family, you know, and that's mm -hmm. the way I wanted to feel. But the one thing I will say, also like the games and stuff too, like watching the little entertainment game stuff, that was fun too. But you know, there's a lot of support for this team, a lot more than, you know, in recent years. And that was just nice to see a lot of people genuinely care. Um, but I will say uh, I'm a little jealous of, like, Memphis's uh, social media team because I think that's where we need to get to. I mm -hmm. think we need to, like, because, you know, they have uh, Moneybag Yo and, like, Yo Gotti and Glorilla and Italy Choppa doing commentary for them on, on hype videos and promotional pieces. I feel like we should be able to do that. I mean, we have a lot of, you know, rap talent, a lot of nice culturally uh, culturally sound talent, you know, mm. uh, especially in the basketball world. Cause, you know, hip-hop and basketball are kind of intertwined. Every basketball player wants to be a rapper. Every rapper wants to be a hooper. You know, that's that's how that works. Yeah. Um, and I just feel as if uh, they, need to, they need to really put our culture out there. Memphis' culture is out there, right? Yeah. <laughs> like – the league now knows about Memphis culture because mostly of, they're most, of, yeah yeah mostly because of uh, John Morant and what he does off yeah. the court. They know about Memphis culture. However, <laughs> they're unapologetically <laughs> Memphis, man. That's that's just the way it is. They're not apologizing nobody. I think we need to be unapologetically New Orleans because New Orleans is an amazing place, and I really want to see the the social media team just kind of just. Just, just lean into being New Orleans. Get Lil Wayne or something on, on something. <laughs> currency, currency is there every game. Every game mm. I've been to, currency there. He's literally there every game. Get currency yeah. to do something. Tell currency stand up and go for him. Like, man, people will love that. I know. And like, uh, what was it? Um, oh, it was last year sometime. I can't remember who who he was. It was either Najee or Jose or somebody like that. But like Jamie Fox was at the game. And it's like you yeah. obviously have this tie where you you can reach out to people. You know, um, there's so many different people that are, you know, from New Orleans or in the area that want to see the Pelicans do well and will rep their team, will rep their home, you know, their city, if 
given the chance. And I just wonder, kind of like you, are we doing that? Because I think overall this year, you're right, is that we did have what a majority of people um, would not consider good or hip or, or whatever doing this, but we had people that represented New Orleans, yeah. right? You had people that represented the people who care about the team. And that, I think, is ultimately you know what matters the most. Don't get me wrong. like I miss Red Panda and everything that she did because she, <laughs> she's awesome. But I do appreciate you know, them – really buying in uh, to the culture. So, hey, we had Roscoe Dash the last game, bro. That, I was – I was look, Roscoe Dash had the plays hype, but I was looking at it like, man, it is 2023, and we're playing Roscoe Dash, and then I'm looking at Grizzlies' Twitter, and they got Inner Lee Chopper. I'm getting a little mad, like, whoa, wait a minute. What, what are we getting? No, we can't get Wayne or, like, you know, Rob 49, you know, somebody, like – somebody, somebody, no, man. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, I agree. That's fine. But – um. I think that, that that's really everything I wanted to cover with the kind of what the team looks like from other people, from our perspective, from everything else. You got anything that you want to uh, throw on here at the end? Uh, I will say, look, after days of thinking on it, we can stop the CJ hate. I respect CJ for playing through what he did. And you got to understand, man, CJ was supposed to be a third, fourth option, but that man had to be catapulted into one and two. Obviously, the man was going to break down. You know, it is what it is. Uh, Zion, man, man, <laughs> what, what, look, Zion just needs to get his head straight, man. Zion needs to, he got to jump off the porch. That's what I like to say. You got to jump off the porch, man. You can't be scared about being scared, you know, mm-hmm. just jump off the porch, man. Look, if you re-injure yourself, it is what it is. I would be much happier if you just come out and say, look, I tried, you got re-injured, it is what it is. I'll say, you know what, man, I appreciate that. Um, I really wish he could have came out here and fought for us. Uh, but you know what? And all those people saying Trey Zion, y'all just need to delete your Twitter account like immediately. That's not a hot take. That's a stupid take. That's yeah. that's, that's an uneducated take. Zion's here to stay. You don't trade a guy who gives you 27, 30, even 35 a game if you really need him to. So, yeah. yeah. Other than that, man, that's 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 all I got, man. Ah, man, I appreciate it. That's that's really well said. The thing. Hey, plug your socials real quick, <laughs> quick, and plug all the stuff you do. Uh, so, uh, I will be having a couple of podcasts coming out. Uh, I'm ain't supposed to say it, but the hit is rebranding. I know we said, oh, the hit last episode ever. Yeah, that was just to get y'all hype a little bit. Oh, last episode? No, last episode for the hit because it's no longer going to be the hit. It's rebranding. Uh, might be doing something with another guy later on, but, uh, Calvi Kid 57 on Twitter, C-A-L-V-E-Y-K-I-D 57. Uh, 22 cal underscore on Instagram. Follow me there. Uh, I think that's all the stuff I got going on. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, man. Appreciate you for having me. Yeah, here, man. I appreciate it. Hey, listen, if you enjoy the podcast, please give us a like, give us a follow. I'm Pels Press on Twitter. Make sure you follow Calvin. He's a great guy. And as always, go Pels. <laughs>